Welcome to the first example from chapter 9. Now, this will be a very simple, straightforward example that we are going to do a lot of setup for. And the reason for that is because we are trying to train ourselves on the process we use to apply to every single statics problem, no matter how small or how big that problem is. The sooner that we are, begin practicing the full process and not cut corners to get to the final number answer, the better we are training ourselves at test time to be able to handle any type of situation we see. So in this example, we have two blocks that are on either side of a fulcrum, a pivot point that is balancing this beam. Now in this chapter, if we think about our regular problem solving process, the first step is to draw a picture and the second step is to list the given information. The way that setup is really going to look in this semester or in this chapter is three separate pictures. It might feel like overkill and I, I know that I'm not going to see this on problem sets, although I really should. You should be training yourself on the whole process so that your brain has that kind of muscle memory for test time. But the idea is each of these three pictures is going to have a different goal, a different set of information that is going to be helpful to us. So the first picture is what we will call the real picture, the real picture. And that's just thinking about the picture we would draw for any chapter where it's the situation at hand if we were looking at it. I've already got this um, from the slides and if you're taking notes now, you should draw this in uh, as its own separate picture. The next picture is the force diagram. So the force diagram, we've been building these. These are called free body diagrams. So free body diagrams. And this helps keep track of all of the possible forces in the problem because there will be times when we have to rely on F net equals MA kind of ideas to finish a situation. All right, so in this picture, we are just going to have our forces pointing in the same way that we have throughout our chapter four, five, and six understanding based on where they're pointing. This 25 Newton weight that is a block that has a certain mass times 9.8 already because it's weight and it's newtons. These are both weights, so we don't multiply them by 9.8. So we have the force of gravity of that yellow block one, which is already 25 newtons. And we have the force of gravity of block two, the blue block, which is 40 newtons. And that can't be the only forces involved because then the whole sy system would just fall downwards. Instead, we have this point here that is pushing up. We're going to call it the force of the support because it's not really a normal force because there's not a full flat surface that is in contact with another surface, but it is pushing upwards on this beam, so the support force. If we look at this situation and we realize that F net equals zero, because that's one of the two requirements for static equilibrium, then we'd be able to find out that the support force has to be 65 newtons up in order to balance the 25 plus 40 newtons down. That's not what's asked here, but that is something worth knowing because we're going to be using that in other examples. The third picture that we want to draw is going to be a torque diagram. And I'm going to go through why this is useful to draw as a separate diagram following the same steps every time so that we make sure we're actually thinking about the system that we're looking at and not trying to memorize from a previous example. The torque diagram first step is to draw the beam. We will eventually be seeing beams or sticks or bars at angles, but right now this is a flat beam, so we will draw a flat line. The second step is to choose the axis, choose axis location. In this case, we have a really good choice for our axis because if this were a balance beam or a seesaw, it would be rotating around this, full, this middle support point. 
So that's going to be our axis. And so we're going to draw a star and maybe even circle it to be our kind of standard axis icon. The next step is to put the forces in the right spots, in correct spots. And these are arrows, so they'll point up or down or sideways or angled, but we need to have the force arrows, the vectors involved here. So this 25 Newton weight is over here on the left side of the axis and it points down, so that's 25 Newtons over here. And we have a 40 Newton weight, so that's already a force, 40 Newtons pointing down as well. The next thing is to label the distances. So label distances, and this is extremely important coming up, relative to the axis. The reason why it is so important that we understand that every distance we care about in a torque diagram must be relative to the axis is because that's one of the most common mistakes that we see students make. So if we train ourselves on why we are putting the distances the way that we are, that's going to be absolutely essential to being prepared for the test. So for each force that we put in, relative to the axis, we put in how far away it is. This one is 0 0.3 meters. And this one is our unknown distance d, but we can still label that. And then the last step in the torque diagram is to indicate clockwise or counterclockwise. And let me make sure I um, explain specifically what we mean. Indicate direction of rotation. All right, so that's going to be clockwise, CW, or counterclockwise, CCW. I know this parentheses looks like a C, but it's not. All right, so what we mean by that? I'm going to use a, um, a set of colors to help us recognize that. So clockwise, I'll use as green, and counterclockwise, I'll use uh, purple. So what we mean is for each force individually, if it were the only force acting and we were able to hold this axis in place, what way would the bar or beam rotate? This 40 Newtons, in order to have it rotate in circles around the axis, would have to have the original motion start to look clockwise. So in the same direction as the clock hands on an analog clock. And the 25 Newton force, if it were the only force acting, and we have to be circling around our axis, it would cause counterclockwise rotation. It would be rotating in the opposite direction, these two rotate in the opposite sense, and so they should end up with opposite um, clockwise versus counterclockwise. The reason why this matters is now we can write down, so these were the steps for the torque diagram. Now we can write down that the torques clockwise, no matter how many of them there are, have to equal the total number of torques counterclockwise in value. From our lecture video, we should feel confident knowing that torque is force times distance, but in a perpendicular way. So the full force times the perpendicular distance, or the perpendicular force times the full distance. We saw several starter problems like that, and we'll continue to practice so that we fully understand what we mean by this. The nice thing about this starter example is that all of the forces are up and down and all of the distances are side to side, so that perpendicular idea is built in already. So clockwise, we have a 40 Newton force times 0.3 meters. And in the counterclockwise direction, we have the 25 Newton force times our unknown distance d. All we have to do now is divide both sides by our 25 newtons. We can check and we make sure that the units are going to leave meters behind, which is exactly what we're hoping for. 
And so our final result here is that the distance is 0 0.48 meters because that's 40 times 0.3 divided by 25 in our calculators. If we look back at this problem, this one step of dividing by 25 is the only math in the problem. We really need to make sure we understand that the majority of these early chapter 9 problems are being careful with setup and understanding the physics concepts, the principles behind what we're doing. The math in these examples is really not um, very extensive at all. So if we are skipping steps, it is, it is quite straightforward to just write down 40 times 0.3 equals 25 times D and get the correct answer, but that is useless to future you if that's the only thing you have in your notes, and it's really useless to future you if that's the only thing you put on your problem set because then you can't really look back at it to study for either the test or the final exam. The setup steps are the physics. That is where the important ideas are practiced and where we actually make sure we understand what we're doing for test time instead of just hoping for the best that we're plugging stuff into the right spot. So make sure that you are going through the setup process. This is going to be like a 10 to 12 minute video for, a, um, for an answer that really is just 40 times 0.3 divided by 25. And there's a really important reason for that. The why behind all of the examples that we do is so much more important than just the how. So I will see you in plenty of additional examples for this chapter.